have a very special guest to kick off the program this morning, uh, Congressman uh, Pat Tiberi. And I think all of you know Congressman Tiberi. He's a big friend of ours. We honored Congressman at our annual dinner uh, last November with our Distinguished Service Award for his uh, energy and uh, enthusiasm for tax reform. The work that he's done on um, expensing and um, bonus expensing in particular last year. Uh, so a good friend of ours, Congressman Pat Tiberi. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for the Cash Foundation's leadership, leadership of the S-Corp Association as well as NFIB. Uh, this is so important to, to talk about this and the data that you're going to share today is, is extremely important to debate. All of you know, the, the facts of the matter are that, that we have, in every single congressional district, a Main Street. Now that Main Street, we have businesses, pass-through entities, others of every single type, as Scott mentioned, from a hardware store to a, a doctor's office uh, to a small manufacturer that pay taxes, work hard, uh, and have a tax code that, quite frankly, isn't fair to them. And we here uh, need to continue to rally around the fact that we need a, a tax code that's simpler, that's fair, uh, that's more transparent, that encourages investment, that encourages growth, and that as we do tax reform, they shouldn't be left behind. You know, predictably, uh, this president, like he does on almost every single issue, has tried to find a way to divide, and in this case, divide the business community. Uh, between C corporations, uh, large businesses that, quite frankly, are disadvantaged internationally when they compete, when they compete against companies that are headquartered in Europe and, and in Asia because of a, a tax code that isn't fair uh, for for, the, for our companies to compete, and the president has rightfully said that we need to fix the tax code for them, but at the same time, he doesn't want to fix the code for everybody else. And so our job is to continue to communicate the fact that we don't want to leave anybody behind. That we want to have a tax code that, it, that works for everybody, for families, for, for job creators, whether those job creators are, are C-Corps, whether they're pass-through entities, whether they're mom and pops, no matter what they are, uh, we should have a tax code that makes sense for all of them. So the data today and the discussion today is so very important, so timely uh, to send a message to the to the White House, but more importantly to every policymaker here, that we need a tax code that encourages capital investment, that encourages job growth, that encourages better wages, and quite frankly, you can't leave a majority of American job creators out of that mix <coughs> if we're going to get there. So thanks, thanks to you, Scott, your leadership, the Tax Foundation. Uh, I'll stay here for a little while before our, our conference. Uh, to uh, to hear the good news, and I look forward to working with you to get this across the finish line. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank very you. Much. Appreciate it. Let me uh, give a quick uh, introduction to all of our panelists. Uh, starting off this morning will be Kyle Palmer, who is uh, one of our uh, rising stars at the Tax Foundation, author of a lot, number of uh, very key studies uh, in this past year. Uh, most recently, uh, this new study, an overview of pasture businesses in the United States. Uh, if you want to know everything there is about the pasture sector, this is the study to, to, to read. Available on our website, I think one of the most interesting and actually uh, newsworthy uh, elements of this is in the appendix, which Kyle calculated the total all-in uh, tax burden or tax rate for pass-through entities in every state. Because we often talk about the federal tax which is now, of course, the highest uh, individual tax rate uh, imposed on business owners is 39.6% at the federal level. Of course, then you have to add on the uh, uh, Obamacare tax. But in, in state after state, of course, uh, they also have income taxes. And Kyle's calculated what that total tax burden is on businesses. And in states like California, it well reaches over 50%. So that uh, uh, each and every one of those businesses uh, in that state are now uh, only keeping about half of what they earn. Uh, he's also uh, uh, one of the co-authors of this uh, fantastic uh, chart book called Business in America, uh, a great way of learning about the business community in America, uh, soup to nuts from the, the largest C corporations uh, down to uh, the small businesses. It really puts a face on American business uh, through uh, pictures and uh, 
I think a lot of us uh, don't have time to read huge uh, studies. This is the way to go through uh, uh, a great series of charts. It's available on our website. You can flip through, you can download it, use it in your own presentations. Uh, you're welcome to um, uh, steal liberally uh, from this uh, volume. Uh, we also have Tom Nichols, who, as I mentioned earlier, is currently the Chairman of the Board of Advisors for the S uh, Corporation, S Corp Association, sorry about that. Uh, and he's also with a Milwaukee firm of uh, uh, Tierney, uh, let me make sure I get all that correct, uh, uh, Meisner, Tierney, Fisher, and Nichols. And, uh, of course, uh, he is, every time I talk to Tom, I learn something new about uh, the, the sort of history of um, of uh, pastor businesses in America and how it changed so dramatically uh, after the 1986 Act and what it was like doing business uh, uh, pre-1986. And that's going to be a very interesting part of his presentation today. And then uh, we have uh, our, our old friend uh, Nick Corrales, who's tax counsel at NFIB. Um, he's a former colleague of many of you here before joining NFIB. He worked for, he was tax counsel for Congressman Lynn Jenkins of Kansas. And so will that uh, we'll start out with Kyle, and uh, for those of you listening at home, he will have some slides that will appear here in the room. You won't be able to see them, however, they will be posted on the Tax Foundation website, uh, so you will be able to follow along at home. So, uh, without further ado, we'll kick it over to Kyle. These are uh, what taxes they pay and their importance to the U.S. economy, and um, at the end, briefly touch upon what this means uh, for tax reform, knowing um, the size of the pass-through uh, sector in the United States. So uh, what are pass-through businesses? So pass-through businesses get their name from the fact that their income is passed directly through the business to the owners, and then the owners pay taxes on that income on their individual tax returns. Um, there are several types of pass-through businesses, as Scott said previously, sole proprietorships, partnerships, LLCs, and S-corporations. Since pass-through businesses <coughs> pass their income and losses directly to their owners, these businesses face similar tax rates as individuals. So they're going to be facing the federal individual income tax, top rate of 39.6, plus a little bit more for the P's limitation on itemized deductions, uh, state and local income taxes, uh, payroll taxes, the self uh, or self-employment taxes uh, to fund Social Security and Medicare. Um, but like individuals, they also get the benefits of itemized deductions um, as well. On top of this, there are other taxes that pass-through businesses have to deal with. Um, the ACA net investment income tax, 3.8%. This is especially important for passive shareholders of S corporations. Uh, the alternative minimum tax. Uh, this, uh, according to a Treasury report, about 2 million tax returns with business income uh, had faced the AMT in 2007, I believe. Um, state and local franchise taxes. Some states uh, levy special taxes on business entities. Uh, for instance, California taxes S corporations 1.5% of net income before the income is passed to their owners. Um, and then some states don't recognize certain pass through business entities. Uh, for instance, Tennessee, uh, they don't recognize S corporations. They treat them as C corporations. They're not connected to the federal code, so there's a mess there. New Hampshire also, their business profit tax hits all businesses regardless of form at 8.5%. Uh, combined, uh, the income taxes that pass through businesses face can be quite high. Here's just a sample calculation of the top marginal tax rate in California. Uh, as you can see here, once uh, a business hits about the million dollar net income mark, um, they're paying about $51.90 to federal and state governments on every $100 that they're earning. Um, and I calculated this for all states. It's a little hard to see, but even in states without income taxes, such as Texas, the top marginal rate is 42.6%. And these are for sole proprietorships. Um, the taxes vary uh, slightly depending on the business form and the state and how uh, laws treat different types of income in these states. Now, it's important to point out that since the federal government <coughs> has arbitrarily chosen to tax business form, two types of bi business forms differently, it causes two different marginal rates for the forms. Here is just a, a, a basic uh, comparison of the marginal tax rate for C corporations, the entity level tax plus the individual level tax, compared to what, how, what a pass-through business goes through. 
Now, a, little, a bunch of caveats here. The, the C corporation is able to defer the individual level tax um, for a long period of time. Sometimes they never face that additional tax because some tax-exempt entities own a lot of those corporate stocks. Um, but the point here is to show that there is significant non-neutral treatment of business forms in the United States. Um, so, how have uh, the pass-through sector, how has it grown? Uh, so, in the past 30 years, since uh, 1980, the number of businesses is, uh, filing tax returns has grown from about 13 million to about 32 million. And more than 100% of that growth is due to pass-through businesses. And I say that because C corporations have actually declined in absolute and relative terms. Um, there are approximately only 1.5 million C corporations now filing tax returns um, compared to about 30 million pass-through businesses filing returns. So today, it's about 95% of all businesses in the United States are pass-throughs. Um, and in something that people don't realize is there are more than twice as many S corporations in the United States than there are C corporations. And due to that growth in the number of returns, well, pass-throughs are now earning a majority of all business income in the United States. So in 2011, <coughs> 60% of all business income was earned by pass-through businesses, 40% C-corporations. That was flipped in 1980, where C-corporations were earning about 70% of all net income. On top of that, pass-through businesses employ a majority of all private sector workers in the United States. Um, according to census data, 65.7 million people worked for or were self-employed as pass-through businesses. Um, compared to the 55 million who were working for or self-employed as C corporations in 2011. Um, the largest employers among the pastors are S corporations, um, and that's due to the fact that their size is on average a lot bigger. Um, and, this, and they're important to every single state. Of the pri these things are, uh, again, hard, hard to see um, the, on the U.S. map, but in almost every single state, more than half of the private sec the sector or private sector employment is through pass-through businesses, not C corporations. Some states, it's more than 60%. Now, it's tempting uh, when talking about pass-through businesses is to equate them to, um, to small businesses, uh, but that's, that's only half true. Um, so if you took all the employees in the private sector and put them in two buckets, those working for C corporations and those working for pass-through entities, <coughs> you'll see that C corporations, on average, are a lot larger. About 70% of all workers um, who are working for C corporations are working for, the, are for firms with 500 or more employees, while pass-through businesses, about 30% of them are self-employed. But it's important to point out um, the bottom bar all the way to the right, the dark blue, 15.5% of all uh, employees working at pass-through businesses are working at firms with 500 or more employees. So pass-through businesses aren't always small businesses. Some of them are substantially big firms um, that earn a lot of net income and pay, uh, pay a lot of taxes. Um, so this actually, from a policy perspective, this is important uh, for two reasons. One, you avoid sort of the trap of, well, it's okay to, to raise the top marginal individual tax rate. You're only hitting self-employed individuals. Well, not really. You're hitting uh, employers that are employing millions of individuals. And number two, you avoid the trap of, say, um, lawmakers in Kansas saying that we're going to give a small business tax break and exempt all pass-through business income. Well, kind of, but you're exempting the income of very large firms as well, so that's not a very well-targeted policy. Um, pass-through businesses account for nearly 40% of all private sector payroll. Um, so according to the census, again, it's about $1.6 trillion in wages and salaries in 2011 were paid, uh, paid out to employees of pass-through businesses. Um, these numbers are a little, a little biased. They don't show self-employment income, so the number for pass-throughs are going to, it's going to be a little bit higher because of all the sole props that are earning income but aren't paying payroll, they're just earning it themselves. Uh, pass-through businesses also um, in our in every single industry. What this looks at is the share of employment in each industry broken down by C corporations and pass-through businesses. Pass-through businesses, the employment's concentrated more in 
service sector industries. So utilities, construction, transportation, healthcare, education. While C corporations are more important employers in manufacturing, uh, this may make sense if you know that uh, most, uh, a lot of overseas in, uh, business is done by multinational corporations, and a lot of that is manufacturing. And then just one last thing from I, looking at IRS data is that pass-through business income is mostly earned by high individual, uh, high individual taxpayers. Uh, this, this chart is showing that for uh, about 50% of all business income is earned by taxpayers with AGI over $500,000. So what you're seeing is that a lot of these businesses, they're in that top marginal tax rate. So they're facing those rates that I showed earlier um, in states with rates over 50%. Um, so that's an issue. So how should we think about tax reform um, knowing this stuff? Well, tax reform should deal with all business income, not just corporate income. Um, it's, uh, so when we look at, uh, say, the president's budget, for instance, that looked at corporate-only tax reform, essentially, um, you know, lowering that rate for corporations is important, but if you're going to close loopholes that pass-through businesses benefit from or lengthen depreciation schedules as well, the deal may not be as good for pass-through businesses due to that. Um, two, one layer of tax on business income is ideal. So the, the, the goal here is neutrality. You don't want businesses making decisions based on the fact that, um, based on the fact that they have taxes that they're going to need to pay. Um, business decisions shouldn't be for tax reasons. Uh, so they shouldn't be choosing legal forms based on their tax burdens. They shouldn't be just, uh, deciding whether to distribute profits to their shareholders or to retain them due to tax policy. And they shouldn't be deciding whether to um, borrow money to fund uh, investment rather than using retained earnings equity. Um, and the third point is lower rates overall are better. Um, lower rates on capital income are better. Um, this leads to increased investment because the cost of capital is dropped uh, for businesses. Um, this leads to more jobs, higher wages, and a larger economy in the future. Thanks, Kyle. I appreciate that. Very interesting perspective. Uh, you've seen a lot throughout your career changes in the pass-through uh, uh, world, and uh, appreciate your thoughts on it. I'm not that old, but I did start practicing in 1979. <coughs> and uh, the Tax Reform Act of 1986 made, frankly, a sea change of uh, the corporate tax structure and the overall tax in the United States. Prior to that, you had a relatively lower rate inside C corporations, and double tax, you get the second tax when that money was earned and then distributed out to the individual shareholders. Whereas for pass-throughs it was different. But that, since it was a substantially lower rate for C corporations, the large majority of closely held businesses were C corporations because they wanted to accumulate tax at that lower rate. And then that dynamic set up and they were supposed to fear sooner or later they were supposed to uh, pay tax on the second level of tax on the distribution of those earnings. Well, you could, it doesn't take a rocket science just to figure out here what happened. Realistically, most uh, business owners figured out, well, I like the lower rate, I'm going to keep that, I'm willing to pay that lower rate, but boy, I'd like to defer or delay and possibly even avoid that second tax if I can possibly do it. And that, that, that little cat and mouse game that was set up between the IRS and business owners essentially created, created an ongoing statutory provisions, and there was a huge amount of effort and resources, both by the government and by private uh, business owners, to figure out, well, how can we avoid that second layer of tax? You have the accumulated earnings tax to prevent business owners from accumulating too much earnings inside those corporations. You had the personal holding company tax to prevent people from having an incorporated pocketbook. You had the unreasonable compensation limits and cases, this is what was mostly case law, where the IRS would seek to disallow uh, paying out unreasonable compensation because the individual owners were, God forbid, only going to pay one level of tax on that income that they were earning. And due to others, uh, Scott mentioned it too, uh, the debt equity, there was a whole slew of provisions in case of an ongoing resource allocation that went into essentially trying to trap that either avoid or trap that second level of tax. 
Um, I think and both Kyle and Scott, I, I, I don't think anybody advocates from scratch that a two-tax system is a good system. I don't think there's any question that a single-tax system um, is better. And I don't think any, the question is it's a matter of revenue would be the only reason not to go with a single-tax system. What the Tax Reform Act of 1986 did, it did two wonderful things from a tax policy perspective. First of all, it lowered the rates. And if you're going to reduce economic distortion by the tax system creates, obviously the lower the rate, the better. You want to get in the way of the economy doing what it's supposed to do and what people want to do as much as as little as possible, and lowering the rates helps do that. The other thing that it did is it changed the tax dynamic within the United States, where the vast majority of closely held businesses were now able to and decided to go through the single tax system, which doesn't create all of these false incentives going back and forth um, with the small business owner. And I saw that. I practiced for several years before the Tax Reform Act of 1986. There was a set of tax law changes, but probably the primary one was the Tax Reform Act of 1986. I practiced both before, before and after. And essentially what happened is business owners moved from having to calculate, having to factor taxes in. You know, what, what pot of money am I going to pay for this expense? How am I, am I going to earn this at a higher rate? Am I going to earn this at a lower rate? Where, is, where am I going to buy my real estate? All of those decisions, all of those decisions had to be filtered through a prism of tax planning, tax policy, or tax planning, really. And that essentially, once you got to a single level of tax, a single tax system, that disappeared. Essentially, and I, I saw it happen, the business owners would essentially, they would think, okay, I'm going to, I'm making money, I'm going to have to pay tax on it, I'm going to reserve for that tax. Usually they would reserve for that tax at the corporate level, at the entity level. On April 15, I'm going to pay those reserves out to the federal government and state government, and that's it. I'm going to stop thinking about taxes. My focus is going to be on producing goods and services for my customers. And a large, the vast majority of business owners started to think like that. It was a tremendously constructive movement. It reduced business for people like you know, lawyers and accountants like me, on the other hand, we don't, we don't produce goods and services, we don't produce widgets. And so as a consequence, that movement from getting small businesses out of the tax business and into the business of producing goods and services for their customers uh, was tremendously useful. And what I worry about, frankly, with the tax, at least some of the tax proposals today, is we now have, and it's in the Tax Foundation report. We now have a disparity between the tax that's paid inside the C corporation and the tax that is paid outside of the C corporation in terms of differential rates. And some of the proposals that are being made today might actually go in the reverse direction and essentially make that gap larger rather than smaller. And at the end of the day, that's not that won't be good for the economy because it will distort more and it will also set up this cat and mouse game that was one of the most beneficial aspects of the Tax Reform Act of 1986. Thank you very much. And now we'll turn it over to the Mayor for sticking around. Um, I guess I'll just give a little background on who the NFIB members are and why this is an important uh, debate for us, or important conversation to have. Uh, we have about 350,000 members. Uh, of those members, it's heavily tilted in the direction of past years. So we have 20 25% are actual C-Corps, and the rest are some sort of passive entity. Um, so that means you have about 270,000 uh, businesses that we represent that are passers. Uh, so that's also 270,000 businesses that might contract their congressperson if we're not too happy the conversation. Um, so taxes are a big deal um, for the membership. They uh, routinely rank it as one of their top priorities. They broadly support uh, tax reform at a comprehensive level. Um, and they also rank it as one of their, their greatest problems, both in complexity and just the sheer amount of taxes that they have to pay. Um, so in, in terms of that, I think this paper does a good job of shining a light on the importance of the passive community. Uh, it kind of takes us back to where this conversation of tax reform got started in the first place, and that is giving our economy a jolt and producing the largest bang for the buck in terms of economic growth, uh, job creation. And so 
think um, with the president's budget proposals and sort of the conversation tilting just in the C corporation only reform, we kind of lose a little focus on how this whole got, this whole conversation got started. Uh, that is comprehensive reform that addresses individuals and big business. Well, thank you, Nick. It seems to me that there's certainly a lot of advantages to the pass-through entity form. Um, you got the single layer tax, but there are some disadvantages too, as I understand it, and the differences between what a, a C corporation is able to do in terms of obtaining earnings. Uh, there's the issue of deferral if you're a, a, a larger company that's doing business uh, overseas. Can you talk about those disparities a bit and the relative advantages, disadvantages, and maybe how we need to tie these together so we don't have these these vast disparities. Well, there are a lot of yeah, there, there are a lot of differences in terms of the tax treatment, and not all of them are, are policy based. They just happen to be as a result of how things grew up, how, how the system developed. Um, certainly, foreign earnings is something that, in general, and not it's a fairly complicated area, but in general, most S corporations and partnerships, if they've got foreign earnings, they are going to essentially be paying tax at their top marginal rates, which are marginal income. Um, for all uh, worldwide income, whereas for a C corporation, they can have a C corporation subsidiary, um, and that subsidiary can hang on to that income under a number of circumstances, and hang on to that income for a long period of time, and possibly never pay tax on it, and then if they do pay tax on it, there's a potential for getting the credit. And so as a consequence, the treatment of foreign earnings is one area where there's a fairly substantial difference. I would say, um, Clearly, right now, uh, the roughly 10% differential in that, whether we're talking about a marginal rates, which is the panel's report covers the marginal rates, but also the effective rates. The effective rates for um, C corporations are significantly different. I mean, it depends on whose numbers you're using, but you're probably talking about at least 10%. And what I'm afraid of is that we might reach the point where we reach that tipping point where closely held business would essentially you know, see the lower tax rate inside the C corporation and they would make that devil's bargain and essentially say, okay, I realize I'm supposed to pay two taxes if I go the C corporation route, but I'm running a business today, I'm up against publicly held competitors, if I make $100,000, I can only invest so much publicly held business, my competitors, they can invest 10% or 20% more in order for me to survive, I need to switch to C-Corp status and literally spend the rest of my life trying to avoid the rest of that, that double tax. And, you know, and worrying about whether I can move money from one entity to another. And the single tax system, frankly, it got, as I say, it got the closely held business owners out of the tax business and they just started focusing on the business. This would get them back into it, but what's driving them back into it is a big rate differential that essentially says, other companies can retain, my, my competitors, my publicly held competitors, can retain earnings and spend more of what they earn and funnel it back into the business than I can. I got to get, you know, I, I need to have that advantage, even though I'm making this double spot and um, I have to worry about that second way out there. Now, Kyle, when you uh, were looking at the data, you saw an inflection point, I think, when, uh, I guess, 86 was it, when you started to see that divergence between uh, pastor businesses and, and C corporations. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so, so as Tom pointed out, the 19, uh, 1986 Tax Reform Act um, sort of swi uh, switched, that, uh, switched it around. Um, if you look at the data, the growth in pastor businesses um, sort of explodes at that point. I don't know if I can go back to that. Um, well, you look at, uh, yeah, so, so right here, you, you see after that point, it sort of changes. It's it's a little hard to see, but it's it's the decline in the number of C corporations that's the important part uh, to point out that um, that that's it's sort of the business forms switch. Now, this caused this where we're seeing more net income earned um, by pastors than C corporations, and this is actually something to keep in mind when looking at our corporate tax as a revenue raiser. A lot of people look at it and see the corporate tax isn't raising very much revenue. And one of the reasons is not because they're avoiding taxes in, in, in 
whatever way they can, it's that a lot of business income is actually just being taxed to the individual tax code. Thank you. Uh, Nick, what are your, your uh, members, uh, I mean, the President's budget is out, there's been some uh, obviously news uh, about some of the tax proposals in, in his budget. Um, are you getting feedback? What's the sense of, of your membership on, on some of these proposals that would directly affect pastor businesses or C corporations for that matter? Well, I think the president, um, and our CEO wants to meet with Jack Lou and have a discussion before they release their latest budget. And I think the treasury and the president are under kind of the assumption that if they just beef up some expensing for small businesses and free up uh, the rules of cash accounting that uh, they'll be whole despite taking away business deductions uh, and just using that money to re reduce the corporate rate. Uh, it's, and I think our members pretty resoundingly have said that that is not enough um, to make them whole. I mean, if we go back to one of your slides that show that where the industries for the passive sectors is the dominant business entity and the services, uh, for one example, uh, you know, beefed up one Wednesday night expensing is not going to be a, a sufficient trade-off uh, for having a lower rate. Right I wonder if I can return to that issue of, of uh, there is a lot of talk about reducing the corporate tax rate to 25%. Which would create uh, a 15, r relatively speaking, uh, roughly a 15 percentage point difference between what a large pastor would, would pay and what a, a multinational would pay. And I wonder if you could all address what that disparity would mean. I mean are we back to a days of arbitrage? Are we going to see a flipping of companies? Or uh, what, what can you imagine those consequences being? Um, what would you advise your clients, uh, Tom? Well, I as I've indicated, and you, if you get, in fact, actually, if you include the uh, Affordable Care Act tax, the disparity could be 20%. 20 20 yeah, yeah. Somewhere, um, somewhere soon, um, you're going to get to the point where I think you will be trapping businessmen you know, into essentially considering the possibility <coughs> of probably jumping into C corporation status. That's not that's not a great alternative. There are a number of reasons why. Um, jumping into C-corporation status is a problem. Um, and in addition to the, what I've already talked about, I mean, you've got essentially, you're, you're putting the business owner back into the tax business and you worry about taxes. But you've also got um, jumping back in triggers a uh, draconian additional tax if they ever turn on and sell their business, for example. And that um, is essentially, if you sell the business, um, inside of C corporation, most buyers, this is, again, a complicated topic, but in general, it boils down to this, if you, most buyers are going to want to buy the business outside, out, out from the corporation, from the end itself. And so in order for those proceeds to get back in, in the hands of the individual shareholder, you're probably going to start looking at the double tax system on that sale. And that disparity on a sale can be as much as 30% for a $10 million sale at $3 million, but even if I could, and that, but that analysis scales both up and down. Uh, for a $500,000 business, it's still roughly a 30% differential. I mean, for somebody who's selling the business and hoping that's going to be part of what they're going to be relying on the rest of their life, that, that $150,000 on that 500 dollars And so that, just jumping back into C-Corp status, it's not, it's, it's not going to be uh, an automatic, and that's, but that's the devil's bargain I'm talking about. Essentially, what will happen is it will put a tremendous pressure on tax council and tax planning to figure out, okay, I'm going to go into C Corp status during the period of growth years, and then I'm going to reduce my tax rate on my retained earnings during the period of time I retain earnings, then I'm going to go through, jump through all the hoops to get back into pass through status, and maybe somewhere, and there's, it just moves a very simple system one that is working very well for the business owners into a very complicated system, which one that did not work that well for either the owners or the government um, prior to the tax return. Thanks. Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I just, just add on to that that just it's important that um, that the rate differential isn't that great. Um, would, 
I guess it's analogous to looking at foreign countries and how they're taxing their corporations at much lower rates. This is leading to the fact that corporations are looking overseas as ways to lower their tax burden, both there, here, and abroad. Um, creating a tax differential within the United States is going to create the same situation where businesses are going to look for ways to lower their tax burden, um, and they're going to devote resources towards that rather than investing. Ignoring the audience here, any, uh, any last questions? Um, Nick, what is your the NFIB's uh, approach to this issue? How are you um, sort of managing uh, this and, and balancing uh, the need for tax reform? You have membership on both sides of the of the business divide, if you will, both C corporations and, and uh, pastors, and and how do you balance that and and uh, advocating for, for tax reform? Well, for, for most of the, um, the debate on tax reform, it wasn't, it wasn't a divided issue. It was, I mean, it seemed that everybody was agreeing that we were going to address both the individual and the corporate rates at the same time. So you didn't have this, this possible issue that um, some, some businesses are going to see a tax increase uh, and others are going to get a rate cut. Uh, just based on how you're organized. Uh, so this is kind of a new development since uh, the president has seemed to make, be making a renewed push to, to find some sort of agreement or to divide the business community. Um, so <clears throat> I guess until that debate um, progresses a little bit, we're still very much in, in the camp of you have to do both at the same time. Um, you know, just for the simple fact that if you you reduce only the corporate rate, you might not get that much economic growth as the economy <clears throat> as a whole, which is kind of the whole purpose of why we got into the idea of attacking such a difficult subject is a complete overhaul of the tax code. Uh, Kyle, you talked about uh, corporate integration or business integration in your presentation, and that's probably a geeky term for a lot of people uh, listening at home. Maybe we can delve into that a little bit more and what it means to integrate the business taxation um, so that it, uh, all business forms are really treated the same, where all business income is treated the same. And there are various ways that you can actually approach this, as I understand. Yeah, so the goal of tax reform for businesses is to make sure that, that they're all treated equally, and the best way to do that is to make sure that there are, there's one layer of tax on business income. Um, there are a number of ways to get there from where we are currently. Um, I guess the largest change would be to bring all businesses under the same tax code and have that tax code either tax the entity, and then when that income is passed to the shareholders, no additional tax, or flip that around and have a pass-through treatment as it currently is, where there's no entity-level tax, and it's passed to individuals, and they're going to be paying taxes on that income uh, on their individual tax returns. Um, and also, I guess in the meantime, there's also ways to get there as well, you could integrate the corporate income tax system so there's, there's equal treatment. You could fix the corporate side where you could, but the corporation pays their entity level tax. And when that's passed to individuals, there's an offset for that tax that is already paid. So pass-through businesses and corporate businesses are facing the same marginal tax rate. And the tax that sort of, uh, the decision making through the taxes or disappears when you know that the marginal tax rate faced by businesses um, will be the same at the end of the day. However, that's not perfect because you still have the issue of retained earnings. Past businesses have a harder time retaining earnings um, because the, the income is distributed automatically and taxed automatically at the end of each year. I guess that sort of makes, uh, or one, one option is to make uh, every business an S corporation rep top and swell your membership, so to speak. <laughs> well, I'm somewhat kidding, but uh, well, but there's there's some validity. I mean, we wouldn't necessarily have to be through the S corporation format. Right? Yeah. I mean, the S corporation association clearly is in favor of corporate integration and a single level of tax. True tax reform would mean more entities toward a single tax system. And whether, it, as Kyle points out, whether it's at the entity level the tax takes place or at the individual level, if you've got only one tax, you take a lot of the game plan out of the system and get people back focusing on producing products and services for the But there, there are restrictions on what it 
means to be an S corporation in terms of the limitation on the number of shareholders and, and other things. And what if you could talk about what reforms that you might recommend that we um, liberalize the treatment, of, if you will, of, of S corporations and, and make that um, a broader form? Well, there's, there's no question that, and so, as I say, some of these things have grown up historically. Uh, the single class of stock is a good example, although there's, there, there's an issue as to how you would allocate income if you didn't have some income. And then the limitation today is 100 share, uh, shareholders? 100 shareholders, plus there's also family elections, so that if you've got, you know, let's say, a large family or two large families, they can count as, as a single shareholder. Okay. So, um, the 100 shareholder limitation, the single class of stock limitation, probably the, one, the ones that are least policy-based are the restriction that it cannot be, must be a domestic individual, either as an individual citizen. In general, the shareholders must be citizens or resident aliens, so in other words, taxed on the entire United States income, or entire worldwide income. And they can only be certain trusts, and they can't be other corporations, they can't be other partnerships. Um, and that does restrict um, getting, it does restrict access to capital for uh, S corporations. And what has been proposed, and which I don't think would be a revenue loser, would be essentially saying that it will allow all of those other types of shareholders to buy stock in and to contribute capital and become shareholders. But the, the trade off they would have is they would be taxed the same as a domestic shareholder would be taxed. And we already have that for what is, what is called an electing small business trust. Um, and it, so a certain type of trust that has discretionary provisions, you can have that for an electing small business trust. But there really is no policy reason to say that you know, S corporations shouldn't be getting capital from overseas, or S corporations shouldn't be getting capital from C corporations, for example. The only thing worth chasing there from the government standpoint is to make sure you get the revenue on the income that's passed through, but that can be solved just as it is for the electing small business trust, where you just impose the tax automatically um, I'm a shareholder, and just to make sure that that tax gap is for Well, perhaps uh, we can have Nick, uh, well, Steve, one last question. I think the discussion has pointed something out. You have some firms uh, going into the C corporation to retain the earning and defer the second layer of tax. You have others who pay out immediately, can't touch the C corporation, have to stay in the uh, other type of the pass-through area. If you simply move the rate to try to find a sweet spot, you're still going to have people on both sides of that fence some being pushed into the seas and, and some much preferring the S's. It's only through the integration, where you're treating them all alike, that you can solve all of these problems and truly get all of this question out of the system. So I, I think reform of the corporate sector where the trades are higher than in the other sector on the combined basis is absolutely essential, particularly for the multinationals. Uh, but if you really want to solve the problem, you, you really need to go all the way to what Kyle's suggesting on integration. And I think that should be kept in mind as the ultimate goal, even if we can't get there from here right away. Any thoughts? Well, yes, absolutely. You might, if, if it's going to be a difficult path, you might as well choose the right goal at the end of the day. And you're absolutely right. Complete integration with the C-corporation system so that there's one tax, not more than one, not less than one tax, 